Afternoon, everyone. This is Pradeep Mal, Ambassador of Change for Getty, the Global Education and Training Institute of Lucknow. We are the premier institute for training teachers and uh, principals in India and in many uh, countries abroad. We have many in-service and pre-service programs. And for more information, please go to 740-840-1000. Right now, you are on our disruptive education platform, which has been provided to us by our mentor, Dr. Sugira Gandhi. And on this platform, we have met with and interacted with more than 1,500 educators from India and all over the world. And this evening or this afternoon, we have for you Dr. Alex M. Thomas. He is an assistant professor of economics in the Azim Premji. University in Bengaluru in, in Karnataka. He has 10 years of experience and uh, he teaches uh, economics there in the, in, in the university. He studied economics at the universities of Madras, Hyderabad and Sydney. His research has been published in many journals including Uh, the Economic and Political Weekly, the European Journal of the History of Economics, uh, Economic Thought, History of Economic Ideas, and Journal of Interdisciplinary Economics. His textbook, Macroeconomics and Introduction, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021. He is currently writing a textbook on the history of economic thought. He has delivered invited lectures at several universities and colleges, including the Center for Development Studies, uh, Central University of Tamil Nadu, uh, Delhi School of Economics, uh, the Union Christian College, Aluva, Jindal Global University, University of Hyderabad, Maulana Azad National Urdu University, Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, and St. Joseph's College in Bengaluru. So welcome, sir, to our talk. And he will be speaking to us today on teaching economics, a critical pedagogy. Thank you, sir, and over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pradeep, uh, for giving that introduction uh, and I'm also very delighted to be here and sharing some of uh, my thoughts on teaching economics with all of you. Uh, so let me just share my slides. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do uh, in this presentation today is give you a context uh, in terms of the state of economics education and what I mean by critical pedagogy and what we can do as educators, whether we are in the, whether we are teaching school students or college students or at any level, uh, to figure out a way to actually challenge some of the dominant ways of thinking, which I think are uh, sort of problematic. So one is the kind of current state of economics education, and this is largely the case all over the world. And I'm dividing it into three parts. One is that. When you look at theory, what is being taught uh, is what is called marginalist or neoclassical economics. And this is what we see in school textbooks and in college textbooks. When it comes to the empirical method, what is dominant is the use of econometrics or statistical applications of various kinds in economics. And in terms of uh, pedagogy, uh, mainstream textbooks are used and exams are very common. And I've put these two bullet points below that because what kind of economics is being taught also is dependent on and how we perceive it is dependent on the university rankings, the journal rankings, and all of them have impact on our workloads too. So whether we are a student or whether we are a teacher, we also need to keep into account workloads when we are trying to change our educational system. Now, this is just an example of a typical economics curriculum, which has certain a set of 
compulsory courses and a set of electives. So one is usually exposed to microeconomics, macroeconomics, and some of these other courses that are listed here. Sometimes uh, there are electives of various kinds, but uh, there are electives on labor economics or monetary economics, sometimes agricultural economics, very frequently development economics, history of economic thought, not frequently, but occasionally. But the important element here is sometimes students and maybe teachers also get the idea that through this kind of a curriculum, we are actually exposing the students to multiple perspectives. But my argument is that based on the way these textbooks are written and how they are approached, what we find is just a single school of thought. And this I term monism, and I'm just taking uh, how this has been defined here, which is the reduction of all processes, structures, concepts, etc., to a single governing principle. The theoretical explanation of everything in terms of one principle. So although we have all these different sets of courses within our curriculum, it actually is the case that it is a monist kind of perspective and we are only using one kind of a school of thought or one principle to understand our surroundings. So one important part of critical pedagogy for me is the idea of pluralism. I think that as people generally uh, we do, we are pluralist in nature because we take insights from different areas of our lives to act upon it and to change things. But when it comes to education, there is often a resistance to include competing ways of understanding the world. Sometimes it is said that the students might get confused. Sometimes it is said that it's too difficult to bring all that in. But I'm going to give you some instances or some pathways how we can embrace pluralism which I think is a very important aspect of a critical pedagogy. So in terms of theories in economics, it's not just that there is marginalist economics. As I've listed here, mean, there is research which happens in the tradition of classical political economy, what is called post-Keynesian economics, Marxian political economy. And it is important that the students are exposed to multiple schools of thought. Similarly, when it comes to empirics or more research methods, if you want to call it that, Apart from the dominant econometrics, students should be exposed to ethnography, textual analysis, historical studies. It's only when we have exposed students to these multiplicity of perspectives that I think that they can decide maybe for some questions, one particular method is appropriate or you want to combine a couple of methods. Uh, often this point is not stressed enough, I believe which is that just like there are fashions when it comes to apparel or clothing, there is also fashions in um, knowledge production. Right? And particularly in this context, I'm talking about economics. And I've just listed a list of items here because at various points of time in our history, these uh, topics were extremely popular and everybody wanted to study them. Everybody wanted to do a PhD in these topics. But as a historian of economic thought, to me, it is very clear that we, just like with fashions in other areas, we go through fashions, ebb and flows of ideas, of topics within economics as well. And therefore, as educators, we should not just go with what is most fashionable today. I think that we need to take a much larger, uh, probably a historical perspective to decide what are the important themes and topics that we need to communicate to our students. And I've mentioned particularly microeconometrics and development microeconomics because today that is the most popular uh, PhD area that across the world that people want to work on. This brings me to the question of how do we understand scientific progress? So in uh, mainstream economics, the way textbooks are written, it suggests that there is a kind of linear view of scientific progress or intellectual progress. So if I take different authors, and uh, Gregory Mankiw is a very famous um, author of a, or is an author of a famous textbook. And it's not the case that whatever Ricardo has written is 100% an advance over Smith, similarly for Marx, similarly Keynes, Samuelson, Solo. 
so if we read mancus textbook it does not mean that we should not read smith or ricardo or marx or keynes or samuelson because they have ideas which are not contained and in the work of mancus similarly i've just listed uh, within the indian context it's not the case that if we read amartya sen there is no reason to read anyone else before uh, sen and the reason for this is the following that ideas do not grow linearly ideas are forgotten sometimes certain ideas are expelled uh, certain ideas are extolled and it's a combination of all these things that you know what we understand is knowledge so we need to be cautious as to what we think is the right knowledge that has to be imparted and along with this of course uh, as educators we need to also be aware of the politics of academia how knowledge is produced who gets to disseminate them why are some topics popular why are some not also broadly the sociology of science so let me get to the, i've divided into two parts just for ease of uh, engagement as i mentioned within economics there are two broad kinds of theories and i've just listed names here for people who might be familiar with some names or who are not familiar who might want to go and look up these names the dominant school of thought is a marginalist school of thought and the alternative or one of the alternatives is the classical school of thought which includes uh, thinkers like smith ricardo marx but also people like piero straffa and krishna bharadwaj who are writing uh, in the 1900s and here i want to get to um, what i think is extremely crucial that often when i ask students what determines the price of a commodity they just have one answer to give me and this is not surprising because they are only exposed to one school of thought and this is a marginalist school of thought which argues that relative prices of commodities are determined by their relative utilities so which is why i call it the utility theory of value and this is what is also called a subjective theory of value because it depends on what each individual prefers and what each individual decides is the value of that uh, commodity this is just one way of uh, understanding prices in the classical political economy tradition there is a theory of price and there have been different formulations of it people have tried to say that prices are determined by land and labor marx most famously is known for his labor theory of value but there are variants of labor theories of value and this is called an objective theory of value because the prices in this kind of a framework does not depend on an individual's preference it is objective in that sense of the term and what why this is important is because very often when we are trying to set markets up when we are trying to establish laws on competition we need to have some understanding of how prices are determined and as policy makers or as educators or as journalists if people are exposed to only one way of understanding prices i think that that's a severe problem and a gap in our understanding just like there are uh, different theories of prices there are also different theories of income distribution this kind of a theory of income distribution is all the mainstream marginalist one is taught in schools it's also taught in colleges uh, it's taught in mba programs and this is the dominant way of understanding how wages and profits are determined and if there are questions maybe i'll take it at the end but uh, this is determined by the marginal productivity theory which says that the wages of a worker are determined by the marginal product of labor or in a crude sense it depends on how much they contribute so this gives the idea that if labor markets are free then there's a harmonious kind of relationship between workers and capitalists and everybody gets paid what they deserve or what they contribute but within the classical political economy tradition uh, they argue that it's not possible to lay down a very formula for determining Uh, these kinds of things and wages are determined largely by power by politics and policy culture history and they also highlight the fact that there is a conflict that exists between workers and capitalists so 
what becomes clear just from these the last two slides that i've discussed is that the way that we understand prices the way we understand wages is very tied to what we have been taught in schools and colleges about what determines wages and unfortunately we have only been exposed to one school of thought uh, similarly within the theory theories of economic growth and because this is a very important policy question and also a political question because all of us are interested in economic growth in one way or the other the dominant view says that if you have an increase in technology or labor you will have growth within this framework uh, there is a tendency to the full employment of labor that is everybody who is willing to work at the given or the going wage rate will find jobs within the classical political economy tradition along with the work of economists like keynes uh, there is a different theory of growth which is called demand led growth theory and in this context the role of demand becomes extremely important to activate growth and interestingly within the supply side growth theory they assume that whatever is produced will be consumed and also within this classical keynesian paradigm or school of thought there is no tendency to the full employment of labor so what this means is that if as a society we think that everybody needs to be employed we need to have some way of intervening in the economy so what i've done so far is given you a glimpse or given you some insight into the fact that when we are talking about very fundamental basic things like prices income distribution growth there are different ways to approach it there are different ways to explain it now if i want to develop uh, economics curriculum with some kind of pluralism and this is one way to go about it that is when i teach microeconomics i introduce the student to marginalist way of thinking and classical way of thinking and i can do the same in macroeconomics and if i also include history of economic thought which gives us an idea of let's say the different fashions in economics or how ideas have come to dominate certain other ideas by close reading of these thinkers that forms a different way of understanding uh, our surroundings and i've mentioned textual analysis here along with let's say courses in mathematical methods economic history indian economy and you can also have advanced courses in like either focusing on mainstream micro and macro or you can uh, have courses within the political economy tradition and additionally i would also suggest that it's very important for from a critical pedagogy point of view i believe to have courses which deal with politics philosophy and ethics because economics is fundamentally connected to all of them uh, and i would also go as far as arguing that just like we have statistics for economists we should also have literature for economists where we are able to gain insights from the from books or fiction that are published by indian authors to understand more about our own local surroundings and we can have courses on gender caste ecology where we bring in both these schools of thought along with econometrics and i would just like to make this point that you know sometimes maybe in schools and colleges we teach the indian economy i think that there's also a case to be made to teach the local economy because uh, it's not the case that the bangalore economy is the same as the delhi economy there are differences and how do we understand those differences like and similarly cities are also different can we have a framework can we have some kind of data empirical and otherwise to make sense of our local surroundings so i i've mentioned a uh, possible text to sort of explore different paradigms so the one that i have on the left uh, is microeconomics for the critical mind now this is a slightly advanced textbook i think written at the level of phd students but i think it gives you a sense of um, what are the different ways in which people have tried to engage with microeconomics and uh, this book that i wrote last year i've mentioned it it's uh, it's at a more accessible level where it's written primarily for undergraduate and postgraduate students but i believe that it will also be uh, easily accessible for teachers in uh, who are teaching 11th and 12th standard economic students and what both these books the reason i've mentioned them here is that 
they adopt a pluralistic perspective that for each question there are at least two schools of thought that are brought in and then uh, we try to understand how to make sense of these various issues and additionally in my book i also engage with the indian economy context so it's completely situated within the indian economy context now another way of maybe thinking about pluralism if you don't want to go that way is that we have separate courses uh, compulsory courses one on mainstream economics one on political economy right? and then you can have advanced courses which deal with issues or themes so we have uh, an austrian economics course which will deal with issues of caste gender religion or you have a marxian course which deals with issues of caste ecology religion right? so there are various ways in which we can bring in um, pluralism into our curriculum at all kinds of levels and there is no reason to be constrained by uh, i believe what is being taught at certain universities because of the uh, university rankings or the journal rankings because education that way in some sense although it is universal but there is a strong local element to it in terms of understanding our surroundings so some of the possible texts in this context that i've uh, listed here for history of economic thought one could look at uh, alessandro roncaglia's book and if we want to know more about uh, contributions of indian economists to economic ideas because very often in the textbooks uh, that are used in call in especially in colleges most of them are written by people who in the west and they are writing uh, textbooks for their students so it's not really situated within the indian context so but these are some early thinkers uh, on economics so in this you will for instance you will find ambedkar's work on economics especially agricultural economics which is of interest and the third book that i've mentioned here is called data feminism and the reason for mentioning it here is because data also is an outcome of a political process and it is important to understand data within a broader framework of power and politics especially because so much of data is being used today in policy making and in convincing people so now let me move on to part 2 in when we think of pedagogy some of the aims that uh, we believe are important is that we want to instill a spirit of creativity we want uh, the students to be critical we also want to uh, give some kind of or we want to make them more constructive uh, and along with this uh, in my teaching experience it has become clear that learners are of different kinds although most of our material is text based and i myself uh, use most of it but there are learners who would prefer more audio based or lecture based visual based or some people who would prefer experience slash practice based kind of pedagogy so as educators how are we able to rethink our curriculum and our assessments to ensure that there is space for learners of various kinds to engage uh, meaningfully so some of the essays that i've uh, given in the past of the courses that i have taught uh, some are essays and book reviews again i believe that in this age of uh, very short attention spans i mean giving a book review is actually to get students to read a book from cover to cover and have a opinion um, a critical opinion on the book itself group presentations are another way of uh, i think that this is familiar to most of you but i so i'm not going to go into detail but just to highlight this fact that sometimes uh, as educators we also might end up uh, giving a lot of assessments and that becomes too much for us uh, because of our workload and it can also become too much for the student if there is too many assessments so i think that we have to come up with a judicious um, proportion of assessments which is favorable to both students as well as ourselves Uh, i think that it's important as educators to focus on what kind of text that we use uh, and not just use i think a single textbook because there are 
kind of ideas in books that will not be captured in a textbook so i i believe it's important to give extracts and at least students get a flavor of how classic books and articles are written so there are economic classics let's say the books by smith or the books by keynes do students get a sense of how they are arguing i think that certain book reviews are uh, can be given also as reading material for students so that they get uh, in a capsule form what the book which might be 300 pages or so is trying to do similarly newspaper articles i think government reports are extremely important and as i mentioned before literature or fiction and here i would argue that not just in english or not just indian writing in english i think that we should also be able to bring in uh, other regional language uh, literature into uh, our conversation into our curriculum into our pedagogy and textbooks i don't think that textbooks should be the only text that we use to teach and it should just be providing us with some kind of a structure and a way to think about these material but uh, for instance in my textbook what i've uh, tried to do is to give my readers and students a flavor of uh, classic books and articles some kind of government reports some kind of literature and in this process again there is a pluralism of texts uh, just like i spoke about pluralism in theory and this enables readers and teachers to spot similarities and differences across texts uh, this means that they, we realize that ideas uh, might not be very uniform how do we analyze these differences and similarities what is the way in which what is the language in which these texts are written and i believe that all of them make for a very interesting discussion in class so uh, let, uh, these are i mean there are two people that i want to talk about today one is freire and the other is hooks uh, and i've read their work over the last 2 3 years and i think that uh, many of the elements of my pedagogy I, i think also resonates with some of the things that they are saying so i thought that it'd be useful to share some of their views so for freire in his book pedagogy of the oppressed uh, for him consciousness is both social and critical and in that sense it has to be transformative so how do we make our economics or in general uh, curriculum and pedagogy transformative and uh, in this work it is very clear that pedagogy is not something that is top down um, that it's not coming from teachers for teachers it has to be something that evolves in conversation with our students because what we want to communicate and what students are able to receive depends on their backgrounds their aspirations and experiences so it has to be in communion it has to be in dialogue with each other and knowledge has to be seen as a process of inquiry uh and again these are some of the points that he uh, makes further which is that the students are now critical co-investigators in dialogue with the teacher so how can we make a classroom such a space of course i must mention here that if we have class sizes of 50 or 100 students many of these uh, pedagogic practices are extremely difficult to undertake so there has to be some discussions around uh, classroom size as well bell hooks who is also inspired um, by freire she sees the classroom as a place of promise and possibility uh, where we uh, can bring some kind of excitement to the class uh, so as i mentioned i think that the large class size is a significant constraint to the kind of pedagogy that or critical pedagogy that we want to uh, adopt uh, and for hooks it's important that as teachers or educators we be vulnerable in the classroom and she also values what she calls a learning community where both educators and students are sort of in communion with each other in in inquiring about some of uh, these things so now let me just uh, make some concluding remarks in terms of pluralism what i mentioned so far is there are various ways of understanding the world whether we look at theory uh i mentioned there are different kinds of theories of price theories of income distribution and theories of economic growth so whether we teach microeconomics or macroeconomics it is possible to introduce students to multiple ways of understanding the world 
when it comes to empirics uh, also we should not favor only econometrics but there should be a committed effort to introduce students to different ways of knowing and this could include textual analysis it could include ethnography and other methods similarly pedagogy i believe has to be more critical in the sense of freere and hooks where we think of the classroom as a space as a, a community where we are trying to learn together of course it is the case that educators as educators we have some more understanding of conceptual knowledge and contextual knowledge than the students but this does not mean that uh, knowledge is finite or complete that way and there are so many possibilities of learning and uh, for me it is also important to highlight that because theory matters uh, the kind of conceptual framework that we have been taught matters so much for practical and there are practical consequences both in the realm of broadly government policy and also in the sense of uh, the practice of politics whether it's at the home or outside the home and for this reason alone i think that it's extremely crucial that as educators we expose students to multiple ways of knowing and in the context of economics uh, people sometimes think that uh, econometrics is in some sense does not have a history but even within econometrics or in statistics there are different kinds of theories how do we decide which theory to choose and i believe a good curriculum should be one that provides this choice to the students and they make an informed opinion similarly econometrics has a particular history how do we communicate that and there's also philosophy of econometrics uh, how do we incorporate them into our pedagogy so that uh, students are much more aware of the history and the philosophy of economics itself uh, because very often economics is seen as a mathematical science and it uses calculus um, extensively just like with econometrics there are different uh, theories within mathematics mathematics or calculus has a history of its own there is also a philosophy of calculus or a philosophy of mathematics so how do we make students appreciate the role of calculus or the competing mathematical methods that there are uh, with their different kinds of histories and philosophies so i believe that from theory we sometimes act it's also possible that just by looking at data alone we are uh, we try to make certain policy recommendation or we act on it and if we bring theory and empirics together also people want to say that in order to be able to act meaningfully we need to have both of them well that is certainly true um, big data sets with statistical analysis is important but here i would just uh, try to give you know couple of words of caution one is that we need to really recognize that the context matters so if you are working within the indian economy context uh, and what is our local context is it possible for me to just you know translate the policy recommendations that i gave in karnataka to that in uttar pradesh or is it possible for me to translate the policies that i gave in nagaland directly to bihar so it's important that we have a deep understanding of the context and it's not just that it's also important uh, especially this is i'm um, uh, this is primarily addressed to policy making and not necessarily to educators but i think this is a point that as educators of economics that we can make that as economists we might have a particular view on what is good for the society but it's also important to keep in mind what the wishes of the community are and uh, lastly i've just mentioned rankings here because very often education gets tied to rankings of various kinds we want to rank students we want to rank universities we want to rank places to study but all these rankings are very outward looking because most of the i believe at least the kind of learning that we want to inculcate cannot really be captured quantitatively or not in the way that these rankings do so to have a kind of critical pedagogy i think that uh, you know rankings are certainly not very helpful and we should go beyond them uh, so that we are able to 
have a meaningful engagement across students within students between educators and as a learning community as a whole so i'll stop here thank you so uh, thank you very much sir uh, dr alex thomas for that talk on teaching economics uh, critical pedagogy uh, sir for a classroom size of about 30 to 40 students what would you recommend as a very good methodology for teaching uh, economics or several aspects of economics uh i would say that even 30 to 40 is bit on the uh, larger side if let's say that we are only teaching one course and we are only teaching 40 students then it means that some kind of individual engagement with students becomes possible uh, and i feel as teachers one thing we could do is we give a certain question in class but then we tell students to go out talk to your friends and explore that uh, because the at least to me the purpose is creating a learning community and as a teacher or as an educator i'm facilitating this kind of uh, knowledge community where i don't have to be present all the time but i i do want to give certain guidelines and uh, maybe tips on how it can be brought about so that's one option uh, the other would be i mean it depends on uh, the homogeneity of the class but if the class is largely homogeneous then i think that group discussions uh, can be a way to uh, get people excited and certainly i think bringing material from different places uh, where we are challenged because often in a textbook uh, the kind of attitude we read it uh, is that okay this is settled this is what we know but as researchers we also know that constantly knowledge is being challenged and new knowledge is being produced so i think that uh, this kind of uh, insight i believe is also crucial and this can be done in a, even if it's a large class setting so that students understand how knowledge gets produced thank you sir thank you very much for that and good evening everybody and before we leave i request you to watch our detox of our disruptive literacy movement by global dream and initiative by dr sunita gandhi since 2014 this is to ensure everyone's participa participation by a people's movement in helping india achieve total foundational literacy and numeracy so basically each one teach one and those of us who can afford to teach more than one should be doing that to ensure that we try to bridge this gap to a certain extent between those of us who have been more fortunate and those of us who have not been so fortunate to be able to uh, get this basic uh, literacy and numeracy so thank you everybody good evening and goodbye see you again tomorrow and thank you so much alex uh, dr alex thomas thank you